Okay, welcome back. Uh, we are now into the second half, and uh, it's a really great pleasure and honor for me to introduce uh, the next two speakers because their work is so close to my heart that I am looking forward to the newest uh, results, uh, which will be first given by Bob Woods. Bob Woods is, um, I would call him, the professor of sensory motor research. He is the founding chief of, the, of this laboratory at the NIH, and uh, he is <coughs> very influential in introducing the awake monkey work on the visual and visual motor system to the scientific community. His lab has had many, many postdocs uh, which have had their careers uh, just named Bill Newsom or Doug Munoz and so on and so on. But now we will hear the professor himself. <laughs> Can you hear me? <laughs> okay, thank you, Peter, for your very kind introduction. And it's a... Uh, Pleasure to be here and essential to start the clock. So, uh, okay? Yeah. Good. Thank you. Uh, so, it, it, it's a pleasure to be here, and uh, I have known Nikos since he was at MIT, almost longer than he probably remembers. And uh, it's been, he's always been a great pleasure to see, and I admire his innovative science and his joyous approach to doing science. Um, the, the picture is not of the NIH campus. It's, um, it's uh, Glacier National Park in, in Montana, and I put it up to remind us of the other major project that we have, and that's uh, saving the climate. And after all, uh, the real question is, why aren't our brains good enough to uh, tackle this problem? And uh, maybe in uh, uh, solving some of the mysteries, we'll come up with how we can save the planet. Um, but this is Glacier Park National Park now. In a couple of years, it will be no glaciers at all. National Park. Okay, so what I'd like to talk about today is corollary discharge, uh, which I look on as a multi-purpose anticipatory system. And the first thing that I need to do, obviously, is to explain what I mean by corollary discharge. So there are sensory motor areas in the brain, and uh, the major output of them is uh, a movement command to move the eyes, in the case of the experiments I'm doing, or move the limbs. But at the same time, there's a corollary of that movement command, a copy, and that corollary uh, goes to other parts of the brain and informs the brain that the movement is about to occur. And the most important thing about it is the corollary discharge is anticipatory. It comes before the movement, just as the command to move the muscles is going to come before the muscle movement, so the corollary discharge comes before the movement itself. So it is anticipatory. Now, I'm going to use the term corollary discharge, uh, but it's, uh, it's essentially the same as Efren's copy and uh, their equivalent terms, uh, Sperry uh, worked on fish, and von Holst and Middlestadt worked on flies, and they both published in 1940, 1950. Oh, it's right there. Um, and uh, these terms are used by me interchangeably. Uh, I tend to prefer corollary because much of what I'm going to be talking about is not related uh, to anything close to efferents, but is much higher in the nervous system, and I think it's a, uh, uh, a system that is, a, uh, is very applicable to higher levels of the nervous system. Well, uh, the corollary discharge is found throughout the animal kingdom, and uh, from sea slugs to primates. One, one of my favorite uh, illustrations is the cricket where uh, when the cricket rubs its le legs together, it produces the chirp, 
And at the same time, there's a corollary discharge from the legs that goes to the auditory system to raise the threshold and uh, dim the, so to speak, the chirp so the cricket isn't uh, deafened by the uh, event. So corollary discharge is throughout the animal kingdom and uh, what I'm going to be interested in is talking about the ways that it's used, not only uh, in the primate, but just in the visual and ocular motor system of the primate. So I, I want to consider uh, these multiple uses of correlate discharge in the primate and consider four points. One is uh, identifying a corollary discharge in monkeys. Second is a cor corollary discharge contribution to perceptual continuity across saccades. The third is a corollary discharge contribution to saccadic suppression. And the fourth is corollary discharge in monkeys and compromised agency in schizophrenia. Uh, this is a possible relation of corollary discharge, a human brain disorder that I'll talk about just, just briefly at the end. Well, uh, the first question is, where is a corollary in the monkey brain, and how do we identify it? Well, if, I, if it's based in a sensory motor area, a good sensory motor area would be the superior colliculus in the brainstem. Uh, there are movement commands, obviously, that go out from that to move the eyes. And uh, the, uh, we have, in previous experiments, uh, many years ago, uh, including starting with, with Mickey, um, we found uh, evidence of a corollary discharge in that when the monkey moved its eyes, the background noise was suppressed, and this was highly likely to come, and I, we, we demonstrated that it was from a corollary discharge. But the, 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 um, while we found those indications in visual, uh, the visual response in superficial superior colliculus neurons, the problem was, uh, if this corollary discharge is important, you expect to find a pathway upward to cerebral cortex. Uh, having the uh, corollary just in the superior clicker seemed pretty limited. But it was almost 20 years later when uh, Lynch, Hoover, and Strick uh, uh, found a pathway from superior colliculus to the uh, thalamus, the medial dorsal nucleus of the thalamus, and from there to the frontal eye fields. So that that uh, opened a pathway for the uh, corollary discharge to be considered uh, in uh, cortical function. So uh, Mark Summer went a step further and showed that this is a circuit upward to cerebral cortex, and he did this by recording in uh, MD, uh, medial dorsal nucleus of the thalamus, and uh, stimulating superior colliculus and finding cells that receive monosynaptic uh, input from the superior colliculus, and then that these cells uh, projected by, it's shown by antidromic stimulation, uh, to frontal eye field. So this established that there was a clear circuit uh, that went from superior colliculus to frontal eye field. Um, an upward circuit, however, uh, to cerebral cortex is not necessarily a corollary discharge. It could be information going up to frontal cortex that is incorporated in a higher level motor command that then drives the eye movement. So in some way, uh, we needed to uh, see whether this pathway carries a motor command or a corollary. And this is a con going to be a continuing problem in identifying uh, corollary discharge in the monkey brain or any brain. <coughs> and uh, we attacked it by uh, breaking the circuit with musimal inactivation of the medial dorsal relay neurons uh, and this break would uh, reveal, uh, by using a test, uh, which it was, corollary or command. And the test we used was the double-step task that reveals saccadic dependence on a corollary discharge. So in this experiment, uh, the monkey looks at the fixation point, and then two targets come on. And the monkey makes a saccade first to the, to the first target and then to the second target. 
And uh, what's going on here is that if there's a corollary discharge in blue, then the normal case, uh, the first saccade is just to the visual target, doesn't have anything to do with following a corollary discharge, but it generates a corollary discharge of that last eye movement. And that provides information that uh, allows the second eye movement to go straight up and uh, hit the target. Uh, if there is no corollary discharge at all, the first saccade would be the same. It's a saccade to a visual target. The second one wouldn't have a corollary discharge to say where the eye was, and it would make, presumably, this uh, angled um, uh, direction here as if it were making a, uh, a saccade from here to here. Okay, the, these are the extremes with no corollary discharge. Now, when, when we do the inactivation, uh, what we try to do is make the smallest uh, dis, uh, injection we can because we want to uh, inactivate the cells we're recording at the site, but we don't want to spread too far because I, I have to tell you that I don't know what's in the thalamus in, in, uh, beyond these particular cells. Uh, it's what I call a wasteland and what more uh, optimistic people Nikos would call a frontier. <laughs> uh, but uh, so, so the, the, re, uh, the point is the reaction we, uh, we get is fairly limited as shown on this uh, uh, example. The blue is the normal where the monkey makes this again to the first target and then the second target with the corollary discharge. The second is where the monkey makes the first saccade by the, two, by the visual target, no, no change, with inactivation. But during the inactivation, the second uh, saccade is deflected uh, significantly differently. And notice it's deflected in the direction you'd expect if there was uh, no, uh, if, if there were this kind of corollary movement. Okay, uh, the other thing I, I should mention is, is uh, uh, admit the uh, neurophysiologist's arrogance, and that's that uh, if I cut this uh, circuit here, that's it. Well, yeah, every neurophysiologist will, will smile at the other neurophysiologist, um, uh, because uh, there, there could be a dozen of these pathways going up, and we just happen to have, have identified one of them. So that's a caveat also in all these inactiva inactivation experiment, experiments which I'll use. So, uh, uh, perturbing this uh, corollary discharge pathway should disrupt a saccade dependent on a corollary discharge, the second saccade that depends on a corollary discharge is altered. Perturbing the corollary discharge pathway should not alter the saccades themselves. The first saccade that depends just on vision is not altered. So I think the point of this uh, first section is we've established a circuit for saccades from superior colliculus to a frontal eye field. Breaking the circuit showed that it carries a corollary discharge and it also illustrates the general problem of identifying corollary discharge, the necessity of distinguishing corollary discharge from command. Okay, now uh, the next two points are uh, ways that the uh, visual system benefits from a corollary discharge. And the first, obviously, and the most important, is a contribution to perceptual continuity across the CADs. Now, to this audience, I don't have to say uh, in detail that uh, we move our, our, our eyes uh, with saccades frequently, that we um, need to do so in order to analyze the visual scene. And the more complicated the scene we have, uh, the more eye movements we like to make. Now, what be, could be more complicated than Nikos? Uh, so we, we need a lot of, of uh, saccades as represented by the blue lines here and the dots are the fixations 
And it's during the fixations that we get all of our visual in information. But the real reason for showing this, and this is after uh, Jarvis's um, paper uh, book, actually, of 1967. So uh, the saccades should totally disrupt vision, but they don't. And instead, there is a visual continuity across the cats. So the, the physical fact is that there should be incredible disruption. The psychological consequence is that there really isn't much of a, a disruption. In fact, think of the tens of thousands of saccades that have been made in the room. You make them at two or three times per second that uh, have already been made, but everything seems pretty stable, I, I hope. Uh, anyway, uh, the issue is how does the brain produce this perceptual continuity? Well, uh, a possible answer was given by Hermann von Helmholtz. The brain anticipates a saccade and forewarns of the coming disruption. The anticipation results from an effort of will. This was proposed in 1867. And the issue now is that could the corollary discharge that we're talking about provide a neuro neuronal mechanism for this anticipation? If so, how could the CD, the corollary discharge, produce this anticipation? Well, a key advance, key discovery, is the receptive field remapping in parietal cortex area, LIP, by Hu uh, Duhamel, Colby, and Goldberg in 1992. And in order to explain to you why corollary discharge is involved in this, I have to explain the um, uh, uh, shifting receptive fields, the remapping receptive fields, and save Mickey the work. Um, so they recorded from a cell in parietal cortex. Uh, they had the monkey look at the fixation point. They outlined the receptive field, put a stimulus in the receptive field, and got a visual response uh, with this onset of the stimulus uh, with the vertical line. Nothing new here. But then they continued, and they looked at uh, what happens just before the saccade is made. And the saccade is being made to this new target point, uh, there's a stimulus in what they called the future field, and the future field is aligned to the new target point, just as the receptive field is aligned to the, to the fixation point. And they found that there was a response uh, following the stimulus onset, as uh, in the record there. Now, there were, th this only occurs uh, when there are two conditions are met. The first condition is that the monkey is getting ready to make a saccade. It's not, it's not just some target sitting out there somewhere. It's getting ready to make the saccade. And the second thing is that the stimulus has to be in the real region of the future receptive field. Okay, uh, so what's the role of corollary discharge in this? It's the corollary discharge that provides the location of the future field for re remapping. Because while the monkey hasn't made the saccade to the future receptive field, it has the corollary that is in place because he's preparing to make the saccade. So the nervous system uh, uh, provides this information, the location of the future field for remapping. All right, if that's the case, then the next question is, is the corollary discharge solving, serving, remapping, provided by the corollary discharge passing through the MD? Now, Goldberg and his collaborators found remapping in both LIP and FEF, and Mark Summer and I, uh, since we had the pathway to go to uh, uh, frontal eye field, we did the interruption related to frontal eye field. So Mark identified uh, frontal eye field neurons with anticipatory remapping. Um, he then inactivated MD neurons in the circuit, just as I had described before with Ms. Moll, and he found reduced anticipatory remapping in the future uh, in the frontal eye fields. 
Let me just give you an example of one of these experiments. Um, we recorded from the receptive field, and that's an example of it, an example of a response from the future field. Quite a robust response, actually. Um, and then uh, Mark did the inactivation, and the, the response in the receptive field um, is just the same as it was before the inactivation. The future field response is greatly reduced. And so the conclusion was that the corollary discharge passing through uh, MD is necessary for future field activity in the visual remapping. So that's what the corollary discharge is doing here. Um, so how does corollary discharge based anticipate relate to visual continuity? And here, this, uh, I'm moving into the realm of inference in, in interpreting what, what we see. Um, so the future field is uh, uh, having neuronal activity that uh, the parietal cell, the neuronal activity for that pri from frontal eye field cell is from both the receptive field and the future field. And as the time to the saccade onset decreases, there's increasing anticipatory activity related to the future field stimulus. And thus, that's why the arrow uh, coming back to the cell being recorded is emphasized, because we're still recording from one cell, but it's getting information from its receptive field and its future field, more from future field over time. OK. Um, I'll take credit and blame for this uh, cartoon, which uh, undoubtedly oversimplifies over, uh, <laughs> uh, enormously, just to indicate how anticipatory remapping might produce visual continuity across the cats. So we're recording from a particular cortical neuron. In the current receptive field is a blue jay, and in the future receptive field is a cardinal. During fixation, activity of the neuron responds only to the receptive field stimulus, that is, the blue jay. With saccade preparation, activity of the neuron increasingly responds to the future field stimulus, and the blue jay is turning a little pinkish. By saccade end, the activity of the neuron responds to the future field stimulus entirely, and so what uh, this saccade is responding to is the cardinal. So with anticipation, the transition is smooth from one to the other. Uh, without anticipation, the transition is abrupt. So the remapping based on the corollary discharge of the upcoming saccade can, be, can provide the basis for continuity of vision we perceive. But I need to tell you about another role for corollary discharge in perception, and that's the perceived location of, of the saccade end that is determined by the corollary discharge. And this has been demonstrated in humans by the work of Collins, Rolf, Stoibung, and Kavanaugh. In these experiments, subjects report saccade end location results from the corollary discharge, not from where the saccade actually ends. That is, they uh, report uh, a particular low uh, target where, this, where they think the saccade ends, whereas the eye movements end in a scattered distribution around that. Okay, so this is another possibility that the corollary discharge passing through MD also provides for the perception of the location of the saccade end. So we took essentially their paradigm and applied it uh, and uh, used it for the monkey. So in this paradigm, it's a continuous series of events, but I've broken up into three. The, uh, in the first frame, the monkey fixates. In the second frame, the uh, saccad uh, is, the, the fixation uh, point is displaced to another part in the field and the monkey makes a saccade to that new target. While the monkey's making the saccade, the target is displaced to a new location. 
that is here. And uh, after the monkey's eye is landed, after the end of the saccade, it has the choice of indicating whether the uh, target is uh, in this direction, behind the, the direction of the saccade, or in this direction, forward of the saccade. And of course, over a series of trials, we can plot a psychometric curve of forward target displacements along here, and the proportion of forward uh, responses here. So if, if it's uh, three uh, degrees forward, he'll get it, uh, say it's forward all the time, and as it goes further this way, he'll say forward less and less, and we uh, interpolate a curve for that. And in normal monkeys, it's always very close to the, uh, the, the zero point, uh, that is the null point is close to the zero point. Okay, then we do our thing with Musimol yet again on the um, uh, empty nucleus, and uh, we look to see what happens because uh, essentially, at this point, we're assuming that the monkey is telling us where it perceives the CAD. The CAD ends, and the inactivation shows us whether it changes. This is before injection. This is after injection for a single example here. And as you can see, there's a shift. And there's, uh, there is shift for a number of injections uh, that are significant at the 0.05 or 0.01 level. So the corollary discharge passing through MD does contribute to the monkey's perceived location of the saccad ending. Okay, so that brings us to uh, the end of this uh, contribution to perceptual continuity. And I would say that the anticipatory corollary discharge passing is essential for the visual remapping that underlies vision at the time of each saccad. The corollary discharge contributes both to the perceived continuity of perception across saccades and the perception of location after each saccad. So the corollary discharge is required at each of the multiple steps essential for producing continuity across saccades. Okay. Um, Let me go on to the next point then. Saccadic suppression. Saccadic suppression is the elevation of threshold for vision during a saccade. It's like the, the suppression of the chirp that, that the uh, cricket uh, has. And it's um, probably the simplest of the corollary discharge functions that uh, are, are produced in the primate. Um, and as I've said before, we've uh, had seen saccadic suppression in the superior colliculus in earlier experiments, but we went back to look at this um, and because the previous uh, uh, experiments were largely on visual background activity and finding that that was suppressed during saccades by corollary discharge. Um, when we now realize that the corollary discharge will produce the suppression before the saccade, so we can put a flash while the monkey is fixating up here, and a flash right before the saccade where the corollary discharge will be active. And you can see the amplitude of the saccade is suppressed. Now, uh, uh, Becky Berman then went ahead to uh, identify a pathway, or uh, more exactly, a circuit that goes from visual cells in superior colliculus to inferior pulvinar and to MT in cortex. And this was done using the uh, and same antidromic and orthodromic stimulation techniques as used in MMD. Okay, and having... Uh, Establish that pathway, which, let me say, that circuit is no trivial um, uh, achievement with the mechanisms that, uh, with the techniques that we used. 
Uh, I think it will become easier with uh, more advanced techniques. But we can then look at to, on, along this pathway and see whether there was uh, suppression. And starting in the superior colliculus uh, with the uh, lack of any change while the monkey's fixating and a clear suppression just before the saccade, we found that to be true. That's why these buttons are too close together. Um, and uh, it, it's true in the inferior pulmonar, and it was true in MT. Now, that's not to say this pathway goes only to MT. It's saying that that's the way, that's the one we mapped out. It, it might go to a much broader area. Okay, so the corollary discharge does not convey to cortex uh, a corollary discharge. It, it's the suppression produced by the corollary discharge that goes to cortex, okay? It, it, it's different from the other pathway we've been talking about. Okay, long ago our hypothesis for, uh, was that the suppression was driven by a corollary discharge from deeper superior colliculus. That is, uh, 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 there was inhibition from the intermediate layers to the visual layers just before the saccade. And this hypothesis was verified by recordings from rodent superior colliculus s slices in, in the laboratories of Issa and Hall. And what they did was have the superior colliculus in a dish. Uh, they could see the um, out output in uh, a neuron, and when they uh, stimulated it, they, they got a, a corollary discharge that you can see in a dish right there, and that that corollary discharge went through an, a, a neuron that had, they had I previously identified as inhibitory, and from there to a neuron that went to a visual thalamus. But the point was, if the monkey were the same, uh, we would have an idea of the circuit that, um, that uh, produces the suppression and then carries it to cortex. Um, well, if that chain of suppression reaches MT cortex from superior colliculus, results from su suppression in the colliculus, then inactivation of the deeper superior colliculus neurons, that is the saccade neurons, should reduce suppression in MT. So uh, what we did was in try, uh, injected mucimol now in the intermediate layers of the superior colliculus as carefully as we could without uh, uh, inactivating the visual layer as well. Um, and we found in, uh, uh, and, and then recorded uh, how much suppression there was in MT. And uh, this is the pre-inactivation pre-inactivation and post-inactivation. Pre-inactivation, uh, there, there was, um, w with the pre-saccadic, there was clearly a decrease in um, the, the vis visual response compared to the visual response uh, during the uh, inactivation. Uh, and then when we looked at the visual response from the fixation stimulation, we saw no difference. So uh, the, the conclusion here is the, the saccadic suppression in cortex depends at least in part on suppression in the superior colliculus. Okay, so what we have is a circuit from visual uh, uh, superior colliculus to inferior pulvinar to MT carries visual activity that is suppressed during saccades. The two circuits in the primate brain that convert, convey these corollary discharge signals are first, this one I've just talked about, that conveys suppression from the corollary discharge, but not the corollary discharge itself, through uh, the inferior pul pulvinar to MT and possibly other areas of cortex. Our previous one conveys the corollary discharge itself 
the, uh, the copy of the, di of the discharge is driving the eye movement up to the frontal cortex. Okay, the last point. Uh, I'm back to the circuit from SC to MD to FEF. And uh, uh, what I want to talk about is this compromise agency in schizophrenia. Now, we uh, attribute our actions to our own intentions, uh, but many schizophrenic patients have difficulty determining whether their thoughts and actions are their own. And this is referred to as loss of a sense of agency. Now, just to give you a sense of what loss of agency would be and provide a little comic relief, um, I have this uh, illustration. Hmm. There we go of uh, this uh, German short-haired pointer, I assume dining in a, a restaurant in Tübingen. <laughs> and uh, you can see that this, uh, put, put yourself in the dog's position and you can appreciate that it, the dog has zero corollary discharge relation, in relationship to the, to the hands. Okay, it, it, it's actually a much longer and funnier uh, uh, take, but you, you, you get the idea. Okay, so one possible explanation of uh, this lack of corollary discharge was first suggested by Erwin uh, Feinberg, a psychiatrist in California in 1978, who frequently visited Ed Everett's lab, and that's how I happened to talk to him. Um, that, that the disruption of the corollary discharge informing patients of their own actions might be the core of lack of agency. Uh, Mark Summer and I suggested uh, that the corollary discharge circuit we found passing through MD might be the malfunctioning CD circuit because, after all, a lot of the uh, uh, pathology ascribed to schizophrenia is uh, related to Thank you. Frontal cortex. Um, and, uh, and, uh, and so uh, an alteration of the corollary discharge in patients might be comparable to our CD inactivation in monkeys. And this is an issue that's recently been taken up by Catherine Thacker and colleagues. And what I want to do is just take a brief look at what can be concluded from comparing tests on monkeys to similar tests on schizophrenic patients. Since a number of these tests I've already explained in monkeys and I'm running a little out of, so, uh, out of time, uh, let me just point to what the um, uh, observations were. The first is the comparison that um, the uh, corollary discharge for saccade guidance. And you'll recall this is uh, what, what the example that, that we found uh, with the tilt over. And they were doing a different configuration, but they also found a difference in this tilt. So that the, uh, it's roughly the same task, not exactly, but it's generally the same result. Uh, schizophrenic patient, uh, schizophrenic patient compared to the uh, normal uh, human patient uh, control subject. Uh, and it's uh, the same logic in the experiment. Okay, second comparison is the uh, perceived saccade end location. Uh, this is the monkey finding here. And this is the human group average and the point here is that the shifts, that, there are shifted curves, but they're not the same type of shifts. We can go in that, into that if there's time to discuss it. The third comparison was the anatomical location of the corollary discharge in MD. In normal humans, MRI diffusion tensor imaging produced heat maps for MD to FEF connections, which can 
go either way in this technique. Um, and I've just selected the two successive sections with the strongest connections between MD and FEF for illustrations. And you can see that this is the outline of the human uh, MD. This is uh, a hot spot for the uh, uh, fibers there, and it's similar here. They're at the lateral edge. We've just completed a mapping experiment um, on normal monkeys. Uh, the corollary discharge neurons from three hemispheres in two monkeys. And again, I've selected the two consecutive sections with the most uh, corollary discharge neurons. And you can see that they're, they're at the lateral edge of MD, this outline here, as we have thought they were in the past. And that makes it uh, quite comparable to uh, what they found in humans. So uh, in schizophrenic patients, they went on to say that there was a tendency for those with the weakest connections between MT and FEF to have the largest errors in the saccade and lo localization tasks. So uh, all I want to say is the results of two behavioral tests and location of MD pathways show similarities between monkeys with mucible inactivation and schizophrenic patients. This is consistent with decreased corollary discharge as the cause of lack of agency. But I think we have to realize this is a fairly early stage of evaluation. And I mainly show it that uh, this example illustrates the benefit of basic research on monkeys. The same ana anatomical structures and behavioral tests explored in monkeys can be directly applied to humans, including humans with brain disorders. Okay, in conclusion, I think enough is known about the corollary discharge to conclude that vision with eye movements would be impossible without the corollary discharge. This is in primates. The corollary discharge explains the perceptual continuity across saccades and the suppression of vision during saccades. A major subsequent question that I have no idea what the answer is, is the extent of corollary discharge other t uh, for other movements. Uh, I've concentrated on visual and ocular motor system, and I just don't know how extensive it is for these other systems. Finally, as a transition, let me say the corollary discharge is a fundamental neurological mechanism, neuronal mechanism for maintaining vision in retinotopic coordinates with each saccade. This corollary discharge acts from about 100 milliseconds before the saccade to about 100 milliseconds after saccades. Proprioception comes later, and so does Dr. Goldberg's talk. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, thank you very much, Bob, especially for giving the outlook as well uh, of the basic research importance for human diseases. And uh, Roberto has the first question. Thank you very much, Bob, for this nice tutorial. Uh, uh, the uh, corollary discharge are believed to be important for the, at least concerning other uh, kind of movement that we can consider and also for postural adjustment uh, for the uh, building this central construct that we call body image. And is that our body scheme uh, is that an important component of the sense of agency? I believe it should be an important component of the sense of agency, uh, just to combine information about what the eyes... Okay, no, I'm not going to violate again the, the law. <laughs> uh, no. I, I didn't get the corollary to that. So. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, I, yes, so... So, so, you know, what, what, what this uh, sense of agency com uh, uh, comparison is, it's, it's an opportunity that, uh, to compare what we saw in the monkey for a, an established circuit um, to humans. But, but there are other, no one would say that this is the only uh, source of, of uh, comparison for agency 
And what you mentioned, I'm sure, is part of it. Okay, we have a question from Jody. Bob, Bob, the coronary system is also active during blinking, eye blinking. Yes, is it the same? Is it the same system or not? And the reason why I'm asking is because there is nothing wrong with the saccadic eye movement in schizophrenia, right. but blinking is very prominently suppressed. So it may be the blinking system. Do you think that's the same pathway? You know, that's a, that's a very good good question. I would think it is the same pathway, but uh, but I don't know. And you, you know, it it. it it's, an, it, it's a relatively easy experiment to do, so I've sort of take, taken up short that, I, <laughs> that uh, we didn't do it. Um, but I would think it, 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 it would have, it would be the same pathway, but I'm right half the time. So that's all I can really say. Good, good question, thank you. This, uh, this answer, Hi. sorry. <laughs> This anticipatory activity uh, just before the eye moves uh, must take visual information from a completely different location in the visual field. Uh, so the question is, how do you envision uh, that this... No, 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 no wait, wait a minute. The, the, the uh, right before the saccade, it's taking the same information in the field as during the previous fixation. Yeah, but it uh, just... Just before the eye well, moves, it, it uh, starts uh, to take into account information from a different side, right? Yes. Yes. Um, so somehow these signals have to arrive at the cell. Yes. Uh, and corollary discharge has to steer this change. The question is, how is this made? How uh, do you envision that uh, this uh, rerouting? of information happens and is caused by Okay, they, uh, 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 to me there, there, there are two questions here. One is the continuity. And, and the continuity, I think, I, to me, it's solved by uh, Mickey's uh, remapping and, and the gradual change that, that, that occurs just before the Sagat. The, um, the spatial stability, uh, I'm not sure is solved. Uh, I thought, I, I was satisfied for a while, but some of my visual critics uh, pointed out flaws that, that aren't really yet explained. And so how to explain the jump, you know, first the thing's here and then it's here, uh, I don't think I've really explained that. So I don't know. It gives you something to do. Otherwise, we've got time for another question. Oh. Yeah. Uh, gorgeous talk. Um, I wonder if you could just help us think about other anticipatory mechanisms that we have to protect ourselves, like the chirp. I mean, we have pupillary constriction, we have middle ear, you know, all of you, you as you well know. And, and of course, you can't say, um, in some sense that there are skeletal movements, but there certainly are there are movements of yeah. bones or movements I, of... I would think this sort of, of uh, in, inhibitory effect is all over the place exactly. because it's so simple to build in. Right. Um, but I don't know. Yeah. Um, but it's a, it's a fascinating thing that this is all through the animal kingdom as far as we know, the yes. animal kingdom. So yes. I think your results maybe this is what you're trying to say to us, but your results are very, very broad and can be applied to many, many, even uh, peripheral reflex types. Yes, I th yeah. think that's probably true, but again, yeah. it requires Honestly, finding out, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. Well, thank you thank very you. much. Um, we are moving on to the last talk this morning. Thank you.